pleasure to be this third speaker today, Rana South, and the title is the Event uh, Clifford Fountain. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak in this conference. Um, and it's a very nice meeting. It's my first time here and it's in person uh, for a long while. So it's very much fun to be able to talk to all of you and get to know you. Um, and I would like to talk a little bit about a joint work with Dan Fretwell, uh, Colin Ingalls, Adam Logan, Spencer Seckard, and John Boyd. Um, and I should say up front that I'm a number theorist. Uh, so this uh, work is focused on number theory, but I will I will choose to uh, focus on side of it that's more related to uh, Brouwer group elements. So these are the things that I usually hide from my usual audiences. <laughs> <laughs> so I would start by recalling some uh, basic facts about quadratic forms and uh, setting up some notations <laughs> for what will appear afterwards. And I might be sloppy sometimes, but for me, R, you see, I usually don't add all these adjectives like commutative, associative, but I felt here it might be necessary. So for me, it's our <laughs> commutative, associative, and with unity. Um, and we will assume that R is an Ethereum integral domain. And what's worse is that all my applications will be when R is a dedicated domain. So cohomological dimension is low, uh, <laughs> nothing very interesting happening at least for you guys, but for me, it's very much interesting. And all my examples will be even over Z. Um, so a quadratic model will just be a quadratic map into some uh, projected vertical line bundle or our module rank one. And a similarity between such quadratic modules will be a, a pair of isomorphisms uh, that commute with the quadratic map. And an example, it's just a similarity where this map is there. And I will also be using the associated bilinear form, um, which will be given in, uh, in this normalization, we call the polar, to make sense in characteristic tools. And Q is non-degenerate if this map is an injection. No, yeah, so I will be mainly interested in the singular case. So I'm, I don't want it to be an isomorphism where it is non-singular and everything is not, has been known for a long time. I'm really interested in the singular case. Here's an example. As I said, all my examples are over Z. So you just take Z4, uh, the line bundle is Z. Um, this is a very simple quadratic form. You can compute its discriminant, it's 29. Oh, we rank for discriminant is easy, just the determinant of this transformation. Um, and here's another, another lattice, another uh, quadratic module, um, given in terms of the basis of the original one. Um, the nice thing about this other lattice is that it's not isometric to the original lattice, but it is locally isometric everywhere. So if you localize every prime, you will see that, well, n prime other than two, that's trivial. But even at two, if you look carefully at this matrix, you will see that they're isometric. Um, so this kind of phenomena is the thing that I will talk about, um, some uh, local global obstruction, which is the things that we number theorists worry about. OK. So next we're going to construct Clifford algebras. I'm going to be a little bit sloppy uh, because I didn't want to overburden you with notations, but basically Clifford algebra is the universal R algebra where, uh, well, squaring is the quadratic form. Um, it has a natural Zimmer two grading and we have the even and odd pieces. And I'm being a little sloppy here. So uh, when the values are in line bundles, the original constructions of even and odd don't really sit well inside the Clifford algebra and one has to overcome some technical issues, but Knus and uh, Bichel has overcome that, have overcome that a long time ago and I won't go into that. Um, and maybe to set a very simple example, suppose our module is free. Okay, both, uh, oh, 
M is lambda. I'm sorry, I didn't decide at some point if I want to use M or lambda. So everywhere there will be an M, it's a lambda. Um, so if both are free, both M and line bundle, then uh, the even Clifford algebra is free and its basis is just given by all the D tuples, um, well, up to some scaling factor from the line bundle. Uh, so in particular, we see that it has rank two to the n minus one. So this gives us a functor from quadratic R modules with similarities to R algebras with involutions under isomorphism. So far, I haven't told you anything new. And in my talk, I want to focus on even Clifford. We will need to use a little bit the odd Clifford construction, but the main thing I'll be interested in is the even Clifford and that also gives us a functor from quadratic R modules with similarities and projective R algebras with involutions under isomorphisms. Now, I will be interested in specifically in things that happen in low rank. And in low rank, we can say more. So, for example, this result by Gruss and Luchanovich shows that in rank three, we really have a discriminant preserving bijection between non degenerate ternary quadratic R modules and quaternion orders over R. So if you remember the rank of the even Clifford is two to the n minus one. So in n is three, that's four. You get a quaternion algebra. Um, and this is really a bijection if you restrict to non-degenerate ternary modules. And maybe the main rank I will talk about today is rank four, um, where we can also say something similar. Before I say something similar, I will give an example why it's not immediate or as simple as the rank three case. So suppose we take a field, but now n is four, so this is rank eight. Okay, over a field, this is just um, a dimensional algebra and it's a quaternion algebra over its center, which is now two dimensional. And this quaternion algebra actually descends to f. And here's the connection to the Brouwer group, of course. You can <coughs> look at it as some image of the restriction map in the two torsion of the Brouwer group. Okay. Yes. Um, so the reverse involution. Yes, over fields, you don't really need that. That's the that's point we will get to in the slide. <laughs> um, yeah, over, over field, it has, it has an involution. You can see it quite easily. Um, and you get a descent data. Um, now, this is a quaternion algebra over K. And not, as I said before, even Clifford is a, is a functor, but not all similarities would map to K morphisms. So in order to really have K morphisms, we need to restrict our, uh, our class of similarities. For that, we use orientation. So an orientation for a free module is just an isomorphism. Okay, it's a choice of isomorphism from wedge n, the exterior product to the ring. Um, oh, I should say that for a projective module, you can just uh, choose a compatible orientation and a localization. And an oriented similarity is a similarity which preserves the orientation. So when you restrict yourself to oriented similarities, you really get a bijection, uh, this is over fields, between non-degenerate quaternary quadratic F modules and quaternion algebras of K quadratic with descent up to K isomorphisms. And I should say probably that this has been done over rings for uh, the non-singular case by Knus, Parimala, and Sridharan a long time ago. Um, but I will still want to linger a little bit about what's difficulty over rings. So again, we can write S for the quadratic uh, algebra of this quaternion. So our quaternion algebra is a quaternion. Now, 
<coughs> now Q is over a ring, so we only get a quaternion order over S. And the problem is that it doesn't possess a canonical descent datum. So the descent actually comes from the odd Clifford bimodule. So one has to remember something else. Um, if you think about it carefully, then there's uh, natural evolution on the odd Clifford bimodule. Uh, it induces an evolution on uh, the even Clifford, but it depends on a choice. So it's no longer functorial. Um, yeah, so the odd Clifford is an S balance projected by module, which means that if you take something from S, you multiply it by X, you get, I will write it as sigma, that will be the involution on S. Um, and if we restrict to morphisms that preserve this balanced property, we really get a functor, which is important for our purposes. So this is a theorem by Owl and Voigt. Again, it builds on a lot of uh, previous uh, work in, in the area. And that's that the Clifford functor gives a functorial bijection uh, between non-degenerate quaternary quadratic R modules with oriented similarity and balanced by modules of quaternion orders over quadratic orders for R. Okay. Um, why am I so much interested in this type of functorial bijection? So um, I will talk a little bit about similarity classes, which is something, uh, well, you will see that it's natural to consider. It's something that measures a local global obstruction. And because Clifford functor uh, transforms similarities to isomorphisms, it will allow us to transform this problem into a problem in a so quaternion algebra. Yes, exactly. Um, and notice maybe this is something important that S here is not the R invariant, not necessarily. Um, there's, there could be a discrepancy at two. And we really want to work with this S. Okay. So I will consider the general orthogonal group, and this is just the group of self-similarities of the lattice or uh, projective module. So yeah, if you look carefully, this GM here, the units is just the um, isomorphisms of the line bundle. And I will write GSO for those where the determinant is mu squared. So the determinant could be either plus or minus mu squared. So basically GSO is the group of self-oriented similarities. The, one that, the ones that preserve the orientation. And I will write F for the fraction field of R and V for the vector space in which this, this thing lives. So the similarity genus of our module um, is all the other lattices in the vector space that are locally similar everywhere to our lattice. For example, the two lattices that we saw earlier were in the same similarity genus, lambda and lambda prime. And the similarity class set is just the set of global similarity classes inside of it, because we only care about these lattices up to global similarity. And this set is finite by standard geometry of numbers arguments. And similarly, we can define the oriented uh, versions of these, uh, of these sets. Okay, so let's see an example. Uh, this time it's square discriminant. Um, so suppose we're taking this square matrix. A short computations will show you that it has a determinant of 37 square. And it has five, uh, five different classes in the oriented similarity class set. And now because even Clifford is functorial, we can get, um, well, it maps elements of the class set to elements of some, um, yeah, I would like to say a type 
uh, typeset here. It's not exact, but maybe a similarity typeset. Um, so recall that we map um, oriented similarities to isomorphisms that preserves preserve the balance property on the bimodule, or equivalently, we can transform it into some descent data. So it is compatible with the descent data. So we get here classes of uh, orders that are locally isomorphic everywhere up to a global isomorphism, but we only allow isomorphisms that preserve the descent data. So for example, in this case, we can see uh, that's because the determinant is a square, that the Clifford algebra is just two copies of our quaternion algebra, but an algebra of discriminant 37, and uh, not a coincidence. And we get the following five quaternion orders. So this quaternion algebra has two maximal orders, two uh, isomorphism classes of maximal orders, O1 and O2. And you can see that O2 cross O2 appears twice. And that's because these two are not isomorphic, but by an isomorphism that preserves the bimodule. And this corresponds to the existence of a non-principal uh, two-sided ideal <coughs> for this order. Uh, you can also see that we have these two orders, O2 cross O1 and O1 cross O2, which are related by uh, the Galois involution on the center. Right? The center of this algebra is F cross F, quadratic algebra, and it has a, <coughs> a non-trivial Galois element, which just swaps the two components, and these two are related uh, by this swap. And indeed, if we will look, if we will look at the uh, similarity class set, which is not oriented, we will only get four lattices, because these two will be identified. Okay, so now we know how to transform these um, questions of local global obstructions for lattices or quadratic modules of rank four to questions of local global obstruction in quaternion algebras, uh, which is very convenient for us. Um, so when I say convenient for us, you probably have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> so I will tell you a little bit about the type of things that I'm interested in and the application that this functoriality has. So I will start by talking about algebraic module forms for the general group. So this will be just functions on the set that I introduced earlier, the similarity class set. And for simplicity, the values will be just in complex numbers. Just a fine dimensional vector space. Um, very simple. <laughs> and um, well, basically investigates the local global obstruction of, of such lattices. Um, so we will say that two lattices are neighbors. If If their intersection is of index p in each one of them. And the nice thing about p neighbors is that, well, first of all, they're always locally asymmetric everywhere. It's <coughs> so they're in the same genus. Um, and they actually, they're actually equal everywhere other than at P, so it's really easy to construct them and it's easy to transverse um, on a set of P neighbors. And the other nice thing that P neighbors give us is a Hecke operator. So what is a Hecke operator? So if I just have a function here, I can go over all P neighbors, look at their corresponding uh, similarity class and, and look at the value of the function on this similarity class and sum it over all neighbors. So this is a very natural operator to consider on these spaces. And these operators are called Hecke operators because they all commute, they're self-adjoint, which means there's a basis of simultaneous eigenvectors for all of them, which we call eigenforms. So that helps us to analyze this space very easily. And maybe 
Another important property of these hacky operators is that well, they're local. So each one of them, right? TP is only depends on the key names. Are you, subject, are you yes. summing over equivalence classes? No, I'm summing over all P neighbors. And some of them, there could be many that are isometric one to the other. They will just contribute. Multiple. Yeah, a multiplicity. So I'm counting them with multiplicity. Um, OK. Um, another related construction that will which is fundamental in number theory, is given such a quadratic module, or in this case, a lattice, then we can construct the corresponding theta series, which is just a generating series for the representation numbers. And let's look again at the lattice that we had before with discriminant 37 squared. Then, as I said before, the number of similarity classes is just four. In this case, they're the same as the isometric classes. And we can decompose the space and get a basis of eigenforms. So what does it look like? I just write them as linear combinations of lattices. So um, this is the function that on lambda 2 will give you 1, on lambda 3 will give you minus 1, and so forth. And we can construct the theta series. Um, so we can both look at the eigenvalues of these forms with respect to the Hecke operators I just described, and we can also construct this theta series. So um, or maybe I should say that the eigenvalues that you get for these p neighbor Hecke operators are just the squares of the corresponding numbers here. For example, you get here 16 and 36. And now all these theta series, they live in some spaces, which right now is just notation. Um, so these are spaces of things called classical modular forms, um, which are objects that have um, value in their own right. And it's not a coincidence that we're getting these classical modular forms. So we want to tell you a little bit about them. So to so tell you about modular forms, I will start by telling you about modular curves. So this is a modular form top. So I will have to we'll have to draw the, the sign of the gang. Um, so this is the upper half plane. You see, I drew the upper half plane. My growing skills are perfect. Um, <laughs> that means an action by Medi's transformation, G2 plus R. And we will be interested in discrete subgroups of GL2 plus R. For example, maybe the most popular example is S2C. Um, it is generated by the elements 1, 1, 1, 0, and 0, minus 1, 1, 0. So this is Z goes to Z plus 1. And this is z goes to minus one over z. Um, by applying z to z plus one, I can always end up between minus a half and a half. And if I'm inside the unit circle, I can use this one to transform me out of the unit circle, then go back here. So if I'm looking at the quotient, I always end up this domain, where this is identified with this, and here minus one over z identified this part of this part. Um, so if you think about um, how this really looks like, you just glue these together, you get a sort of cone, but because of the hyperbolic metric, it's not really a cone, it actually has um, a compact structure, and topologically you see it's genus zero, so it's really just a Riemann sphere. So you can think about this fundamental domain in many ways. You can classify either lattices or elliptic curves or binary quadratic forms, um, which is probably the most closely related thing to what we're doing here. And the specific groups of interest many times 
are discrete subgroups of S of the Z where this corner is zero or this corner is zero and these two are one mod n. Sorry, zero mod n, like divisible by some number n. And note that this is a normal subgroup in this one and <coughs> it is the kernel of the map taking just the bottom right corner in Z mod n Z star. Okay, so we take this quotient and we compactify it by using what we call cusps. That's taking the point of the rational boundary. And these are the modular curves. And for the purpose of this talk, um, I will only talk about certain types of modular forms. So it will be important that this X of gamma, this compactified curve is a compact human surface. For example, in the example that you see over there, you can take a local coordinate at infinity. That's the only cusp for S of 2Z um, because it's transitive on P1, Q. And you can take the local coordinate e to the 2 pi I can see. If gamma is torsion free, uh, I can write M2 of gamma module forms of weight 2 and level gamma to just be differentials on this, um, on this women surface that are holomorphic on the affine bar and at most simple poles of the cusps. And in this specific case, Riemann Roch tells us that we can actually compute the dimension from the genus and the number of cusps. More generally, for higher weights, we also get these are just like. Uh, spaces of line bundles, uh, sections of line bundles, and the of the um, To connect it with the usual description of modular forms, note that upper half is simply connected, so it's the universal cover um, of this affine part. And if we have uh, some differential form, we can pull it back. We get something of the form F Z D Z, and it should be gamma equivariant. Um, and if you really look at what happens in the cusp. Uh, for example, uh, with this example of Q is e to the two pi i z, if omega is some function of Q and we want to pull it back, we get an extra Q factor, which means that, for example, if we had simple poles at the cusps, we will still get a holomorphic function. And if we had something that's holomorphic all over, we'll get something vanishing at the cusps. So this gives us a an identification of the space of modular forms of weight two with functions on the upper half plane that are holomorphic and satisfy this transformation law, which is probably more familiar. This is what I call the space of modular forms of weight two. And S to the cuspidal forms uh, will just be the holomorphic differentials, which correspond to holomorphic functions that vanish at the cusps. Um, another thing that probably will appear later on is that, well, we've seen earlier that gamma naught of n, what gamma one of n is isomorphic to an abelian group. So this acts on the space of modular forms of level gamma one naturally. And because this is an action of a billion group, we can decompose it according to characters. Um, so we write um, M2 N chi or S2 N chi for the, iso the isotopic uh, component corresponding to chi, which means that they just satisfy the this equation. Okay, so here's an example. That's, I think, uh, yeah. an example for gamma equals gamma not four, so N equals four. So this is the fundamental domain. Um, these are the different um, cost of representatives. So one can compute the cost of representatives of gamma 0, 4 in SL2 Z. And then the quotient gamma mod H is just the union of translates of this fundamental domain by each of these cost of representatives. And you see that we get two more cusps at zero and a half. And uh, so we have three cusps all in all because we have the one in infinity. Um, if you look carefully at the identifications, you will see that we're getting a spaceship. Um, that's the first thing that came to my mind when I saw it because you just pulled the two 
the two lines near each pass, um, and you get a sphere in the middle. But topologically, this is still a sphere, and because it's a Riemann surface, we know it's actually P1. Uh, so we really compute that uh, x not of four is P1, and there are three cusps, so the dimension of the space is just two. And this is an important example because, for example, one can use it to prove Jacobi's four square theorem, telling you the number of representations <coughs> of a number as uh, some four squares. Oh, right, I actually written that down here. So uh, the function, the generating function, the theta series of the representation of the sum of four squares corresponding to uh, trivial lattice is uh, holomorphic. It satisfies these transformations formula, which means that it's a module form for this group. So it leads to that space. And the idea is that one can uh, generate in a different manner uh, basis elements for this space. And by comparing coefficients, one can get the formula for the number of representations as sum of four squares. Another thing that might be relevant later on is that this function is also invariant under a transformation of z going to minus one over four z, uh, which is not an element of this group. It comes from the matrix zero minus one four zero. This is something that is called an 18 letter involution, uh, and it will also appear later on. Let's see, let's go back to our lattices, see another example. So if you remember before we looked at a lattice of discriminant 29, um, so I didn't tell you that before, but we saw two lattices that were everywhere locally isometric, but not globally isometric. So these are actually the only two elements in this class set. And one can keep the head operators corresponding to P neighbors in this case. So you see that um, P2, for example, is just by going over the two neighbors. And T3 is by going over the three neighbors. And I think there's a mistake here in T2. I'm sorry. So <laughs> if you'll see in T3, 4 plus 6 is 10 and 3 plus 7 is 10. But that's because uh, there are 10 neighbors and four of them are isometric to one and six are isometric to the other. Um, anyway, we can compute the two eigenforms. So there's one that is just the sum of the two lattices. So we will always have such an eigenform, just the sum of all the lattices in our class set, uh, because uh, the number of the uh, P neighbors is constant. And that's what we call an Eisenstein series, usually. Uh, and these are its eigenvalues. And the more interesting one is an eigenvector uh, that looks a bit differently, and it has these sequence of uh, eigenvalues. And if you remember before, when we looked at these eigenforms and their eigenvalues, we got things that are corresponding to classical modular forms. But here, these numbers do not, do not correspond to any classical modular form. However, they do correspond to something called the Hilbert modular form. Um, and let's see if that works. Wow, yes. So <laughs> by looking at the element B, which is a database for a lot of number theoretic and also other uh, <laughs> mathematical objects um, that you want to find uh, connections with, uh, you can see that um, this object of Hilbert cusp form over basically Q square 29, remember 29 was our discriminant, um, corresponds to what we have because, for example, if you look at the Prime two, you will see the eigenvalue. I don't know, can you see that? It's like, it's minus one for the here. And over five, there are two primes and the eigenvalues are minus three in both. Um, and now go back to the slides. So you can see here, for example, A2 is minus one, that's a minus one, okay. A5 is nine. That's like minus three squared or the product of the two minus threes. Each other. 
so there really is a connection between these eigenvalues and the Hilbert modular form that we <coughs> ex <coughs> exhibited. Okay, so what is a Hilbert modular form? Okay, so we found this thing in the online database, but uh, I should probably tell you what it is. So the idea is not very different from the classical modular forms, only this time we're looking over a quadratic field, a real quadratic field. So it has two real embeddings into R, and you can look only at totally positive elements. So totally positive means that both embeddings are positive. And I will write k cross and bigger than zero for positive elements, totally positive elements. So GL2 plus of k, same as um, the GL2 plus of R that we had earlier, is just all the elements with totally positive determinants. So this acts on the product of two copies of the upper half plane, just coordinate by coordinate using the two embeddings. And Hilbert module form is well, pretty much similar to before, H plus H by a discrete subgroup of GL2 plus K. And it creates a surface this time, not a curve, a Hilbert module surface. And you can compactify it by using rational points on the boundary and uh, spaces of differentials or more generally sections of line bundles um, of the canonical line bundle on this surface um, give you uh, modular forms. So the main theorem, the thing that the, we are actually able to show using uh, even Clifford from the beginning is that there is an injection between the space of modules of cusp forms for the general orthogonal group. So these were just functions on the similarity class set to the space of Hilbert module forms of a certain level. So that's almost true. There are many symbols here and I will try to explain them. <laughs> so the space of Hilbert module forms has a natural action of the Galois group of the field. Okay, just, so we, all, we all get embedding only to the uh, Galois orbits. And that's because I wrote the GO here and not GSO. So that's the O1 cross O2 that goes to O2 cross O1. <laughs> and this is not surjective, but we know to explicitly describe the image. And that's all the other weird signs that are here that I will explain in a minute. So I should also mention that here everything is stated over Q, um, which means that this corresponds to the examples that we saw over Z, but the theorem actually holds over arbitrary totally real field. Um, and that's why uh, the interest in dedicated domains. So, so, um, so um, oh, our life is here as discriminant that is composed of some fundamental discriminant and then and I will assume that they are co-prime for and that n is square free so that everything will be quite easy. Okay, so um, D will be the product of anisotropic prime from quadratic module or lattice and this W equals epsilon here. Um, so remember this guy, what they call an 18 linear involution. So for every prime dividing the level, we have such an element that uh, induces an involution on our modular curve or modular surface. These are the Ws here. So we have one for every prime. And <laughs> we just get ones that have certain signs. So this is an evolution, it splits the space into um, eigen eigenvectors with uh, eigenvalue plus one or minus one. So we only get the ones that uh, have a certain eigenvalue and this eigenvalue is minus one if the prime divides this D or one otherwise. Maybe it would be more natural to think of D as the discriminant of the quaternion algebra that one gets by Clifford. 
uh, of this quadratic space. So what we're getting here are the orbits with this level and this epilinear eigenvalues, and we're only getting things that are d mu. So there are natural maps between different levels. If I have a modular form with level gamma zero of d, then it's also a modular form for gamma zero of n, just by containment of the groups. Um, so d mu are forms that are, in a sense, orthogonal to all the old forms, all the things that came from lower level. OK. Um, now would be a good time to stop for questions. Yes. Is D and D zero the same? No. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry for the <laughs> terrible notation. Um, so, yeah, somehow both are discriminants, but just the different things. Um, so D zero is discriminant of the underlying field, and D is the discriminant of the quaternion algebra. <laughs> Oh, I should also say that if D0 is one, so if we're in the square discriminant case, then this should be thought of as Q cross Q. Okay, this is just a quadratic tau algebra. And then one gets, instead of Hilbert modular forms, one gets tensor product of spaces of classical modular forms. And that's the reason we were seeing classical modular forms in the square discriminant case. You understand correctly that your main goal is to get <coughs> somehow explicit description of the object on the left hand side as a GO of lambda. Oh um <laughs> yes that that was the goal. Um it's related to questions of um endoscopy in the Langlands program. Mm -hmm. Um so basically um When you look at lattices of odd rank, then, for example, for, uh, okay, I should start again. For low ranks, we have exceptional isomorphisms, um, which relate modular forms for orthogonal groups, say, for with modular forms for symplectic groups. Now, when we look at odd ranks, we have uh, uh, some kind of uh, foundational correspondence called the jacquel langlands correspondence that allows us um, allows us to see these forms as, uh, well, to see that these uh, modular forms for the orthogonal group of the odd rank lattices are the same as modular forms for the symplectic lattices. What happens in even rank is that we only see modular forms that are uh, lifts from uh, endoscopic subgroups. Um, and one of our goals was to understand what kind of lifts we can see. Um, it also, I mean, some of the applications are to get things like Eisenstein congruences because we can exhibit really the spaces of lifts and find congruences between them. Yes, so is the center the uh, even the the is it by uh, so is by single element? No, so it's not always generated by a single element. It's generated by single element over a PID, uh, but uh, over uh, other rings, even that in domains, you have to choose a local uh, generator in every different. Can you anything that is more? Uh, well, not anything. Um, <laughs> it has to be this. Like, uh, Um, so, yeah, many things can be said in case by quadratic, but, uh, not, not in this talk, I guess. Um, uh, so there, there, Hilbert module forms exist for any totally real field. Um, and 
the reason we get here things over acrobatic extensions is because I work specifically with rank four lattices. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure it's a topic maybe to discuss afterwards. <laughs> Okay, so I will, I will skip this uh, slide in favor of time. And I will just talk briefly about the key ideas that go into this proof of uh, this connection between modular forms of different types. Um, so if you remember even Clifford from earlier, it induces an isomorphism between this uh, group of self-oriented similarities up to um, up to constants and the quaternion algebra. I write here BK because it's actually a quaternion algebra over F that base changed to K. And by functoriality, we can relate these modular forms on this group with values. Here I wrote down a, a general representation, but you can ignore it and just think about C. Um, to functions on the similarity type of orders in the quaternion algebra. Um, as we've seen in the example with screen 29. Um, and we can describe this set explicitly using some old results. And the main thing one needs to show, one wants to identify the modular forms, not only just as vector spaces, that will be very interesting, but also as modules for the Hecke algebra. So to see that they have, that there's a relation as we've seen between the Hecke eigenvalues. Um, so I'm doing here something quite brutal, but at least for the cases that we looked at, it's not. One can consider the even Clifford and then normalize it. So really tensor with the, um, in the ring of integers of the field. Um, this is somewhat unnecessary for a really clean theory, uh, but if one wants to identify it with known objects like Hilbert modular forms uh, over, over a field, then they're defined over rings of integers. Then one has to do something like that. Um, but one then sees that it sends P neighbors to P neighbors. And that's the, the key ingredient that allows one to, uh, to see the connection between the Hecke eigenvalues. Finally, we can characterize this space uh, as a space of modular forms, Hilbert modular forms. Um, and this is basically using, using uh, Jack Langan's correspondence between functions on a certain Certain functions on the ideal class set of an order in the quaternion algebra and Hilbert module forms. Um, so maybe the diagram that summarizes what we have here is that this even Clifford functor relates the orthogonal module forms with quaternionic module forms. These have Jekyll Angle's correspondence with. Hilbert module forms, and by using the theta series from before, but slightly generalized, one can get something that is called the Ziegel module form, that I will not speak about. Um, instead of counting representation numbers, I can count the number of ways to embed a certain two-dimensional lattice, like a rank two lattice inside a rank four lattice, that will give a, a power series in three variables. Um, that we land here, and this diagram commutes, where the bottom row is a map that was constructed for many different instances, many different times in the past, using analytic methods. And this is a very clean algebraic way uh, to construct all these maps. Yeah, if the names don't mean anything to you, that's fine. <laughs> Any 
further questions. So it's the same thing in the Navy. So if you define the R, this S and U R, this mm -hmm. line model, yeah, so one dimensional. Yeah. So if it's trivial, it is the situation simple. This is a land video, land video. Tell something interesting about what's going on. So imagine it's <laughs> yes. Um, I don't see why it would be simpler. Um, Yes, I mean, um, some of the things we do here use like the explicit construction over the PID and then using localization to gain the, uh, the final results. Um, that's where we really use essentially the dedicated domain property. You can really exhibit uh, a universal element in the center of our PID. Yeah. To the element. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, so the. Yeah, so the LMFDB uh, doesn't contain, for example, many Ziegel modular forms. Like Ziegel modular forms with level do not exist right now in the LMFDB. That's a different effort <laughs> that, um, that we're doing by computing actually uh, five dimensional lattices. Um, but yeah, okay, maybe I should say this is valuable for computation in the sense that here we only get a space with certain actinlinear values. I didn't talk about it, but you can also, by taking values in a different representation, in a spin or non representation, you can really get any set of edge linear values that you wish. So, for example, if your level is highly decomposable, you get, you can work in much smaller vector spaces. So, in the case of classical modular forms, this was used with um, ternary quadratic forms to actually compute um, spaces of modular forms of much higher levels, uh, much faster. All questions? Maybe for people at home, <laughs> the obvious. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>